Hey, my name is Steve Polk and I'm the executive pastor at First Baptist Rock Hill. It is always my joy to welcome you to these online services. Uh, as we have been enduring the pandemic over these number of months, it's really been a joy of ours to be able to broadcast for you uh, messages online via YouTube and Facebook and wherever you find your online media. So this morning, we have a very special opportunity for you. I really want to encourage you to grab your Bible, get your notebook, a pen, and make sure there's no distractions as you engage with the message you're going to hear this morning. Our high school and college pastor, Chris Howell, is going to bring a really strong message about the second greatest story ever told. And I know you're going to want to be fully engaged today. So I'm going to pray for us. And then he's going to come and deliver that great message that I know uh, you're going to want to respond to. So let's pray. God, we thank you for this morning, the opportunity to worship you, whether we're in our home, in our car, in a coffee shop or our office, wherever we're able to engage with this message right now. I just pray as your word is preached and spoken, that people will respond, that hearts are open to the gospel today, and that we are challenged and encouraged to share the love of Christ with the people we come in contact each and every day. So as we continue our worship time together, you be glorified. You challenge us and you change us the way you would, would do it. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to thank you for joining us today online from wherever it is that you're watching. And as we dive in today, uh, we're going to be in Acts chapter 22, verses 1 through 15. So if you have a copy uh, of your Bible there, I want you to pull that out. Maybe a pen and a piece of paper and uh, get ready to take down five notes that I think you're going to find uh, very informative this morning in the message. So let me ask you this question. We've gotten into this time of season where we have some nice, crisp, cold mornings. And so I want to know how many of you could testify to the goodness of coffee today. I mean, let's just be honest. On a crisp, cold morning, a hot cup of coffee is really good, right? I would argue with you that it's not. See, as a matter of fact, I'm a Diet Mountain Dew guy. So you get your coffee, I'll get my Diet Mountain Dew. But we could testify to the goodness of that. And so today I want to share with you two stories about witnessing or testifying. They're a little bit different. The first one happened about 21, 22 years ago. I traveled 48 weeks out of the year, Monday through Friday, uh, left Charlotte Douglas, would go all over the world and come back to Charlotte Douglas. One particular evening I was driving home, it was about 1130 or so, and as I was coming around the bend of the road, getting close to the neighborhood, I noticed a vehicle off into the woods. As I got a little closer, I jumped out of my car, looked, this truck was on its side, and as we went to help the gentleman out, I realized who it was. He lived just around the corner from me. Matter of fact, I lived at 121 this road, and he lived at 121 that road. But as we pulled that gentleman out, I realized very quickly that he had had way too much alcohol to drink to be driving. And so a little bit later, the highway patrol showed up. They arrested this gentleman. They took him to jail. And then within six, seven, eight weeks, maybe uh, um, two months or so, uh, I got a phone call from the prosecutor's office. And they said, Mr. Howe, we appreciate you stopping to help. We would like for you to come testify, be a witness as to his condition and what happened that night. So I went and did that. The second story comes from just a couple of days ago. I uh, recently became the chaplain for the Northwestern High School football team. And in doing that, I got to stand in front of them and give a little testimony to who I am, where I came from, what were my credentials, what allowed me to be able to stand before them. And part of that was sharing my testimony with them uh, so they would know where I stood as a believer. In Acts chapter 22, uh, we find out a couple of things. We find out we never know when we're uh, called to speak up for the Lord. In Acts chapter 21, Paul had been worshiping in the temple, and then he was falsely accused of bringing a Gentile inside. Matter of fact, this false accusation caused a great turmoil, a riot, so to speak, something we're familiar with seeing today. The captain of the Roman guard broke up the riot, and he bound Paul in the chains, and he brought him forward to, uh, to be held that night. As he got there, Paul asked the captain for an opportunity to speak. Paul wanted to share his testimony, if you will. Like Paul, the best thing we have to offer the world is not some um, learned arguments. It, it, it's not whether we can debate well or not debate well. The, the best thing that we have to offer the world is our personal testimony. I mean, let's think about it for a minute. We, we purchase things based on testimony, don't we? I mean, the question becomes, is Ajax better than Comet? 
is a Chevrolet better than a Ford? The answer to that question is no, of course not. We, we ask questions like, does Dawn dishwashing liquid really cut the grease? Is Dr. Such and Such a better doctor than Dr. Such and Such? See, we buy things based off of other people's testimonies. I can't think of one time that I've walked into the store and bought a product or where I've used a service without hearing somebody have already said, man, this is really good, or this person's really good, or this establishment is a great establishment. See, here's what we know in today's world is that we, we are in desperate need of revival. Matter of fact, we, we know that America, that revival will not come from eloquent pastors. As much as I love Pastor Steve, he will not be able to deliver a sermon from the pulpit that will bring revival to America. Matter of fact, I believe personally that revival will become when the church members start sharing their story. It's been said by Billy Graham's staff that 3.1 million people come to know Christ as Billy Graham gave invitations throughout his lifetime. One would think that this man must have been on fire. He was, a, he was a pastor among pastors that could deliver the best sermon, the best message, that he could rightfully divide God's word with, with some of the best theology. But I would, based on my experience of seeing Billy Graham at a revival in the Charlotte Panthers Stadium, or based on hearing him on TV or even on radio, based on my experience of walking through the library at Billy Graham, that he wasn't that. In fact, I think what did Billy Graham the best was that he was down to earth, genuine, knee to knee talking to you. That when he shared his testimony of what God did in his life, it impacted you in such a way that God began to do something in your life. Paul's story of conversion is important. It has to be because it's used several times in the book of Acts. We can also read about it in Philippians 3, then in 1 Timothy 1, we can read about his story. So here's my question for you this morning. When was the last time you told your story? What did you say? What did you tell them? And who did you tell it to? There's an old song that goes a little something like this. It says, I heard an old, old story, how a savior came from glory, how he gave his life on Calvary to save a wretch like me. I heard about his groaning of his precious blood's atoning, See, that is the greatest story ever told. It is the story of Jesus Christ stepping down out of the, out of the Father's house and he, he comes to earth and he lives a sinless life. And in that sinless life, he, he, he becomes a bridge back to the Father for you and I. He takes sin and straps it on his back. He hangs on a rugged cross. And then three days later, he rises again. And so this morning, there's, there's a second part of that that we learn from Paul. At the end of that verse in that song, it says, Then I repented of my sins and won the victory. See, the greatest story ever told is the story of Jesus Christ on the cross becoming redemption for us. The second greatest story ever told is your story and my story. And there are five critical parts that we learn about from Acts chapter 22 that deal with that story. And so today I want to be able to share those with you. The first one is this, is that he established a connection. See, Paul begins in, in Acts chapter 22 by saying this, Brethren and fathers, hear my defense, which I now offer to you. And when they heard that he was addressing them in the Hebrew dialect, they came even more quiet. See, there has to be an, an established connection. It, it, it's what gives us the right to get into somebody else's life to begin telling them about Christ. Matter of fact, out of the five things that I will share with you the, today, the one thing that I feel like God has given me a gift of is being able to make that connection. Matter of fact, my wife accuses me that if I can go stand beside a wall sooner or later, that wall will become a friend with me. I love going in and trying to find the common connection, whether it's football or children or, or church or where I'm from or where I've lived, where I've served in the Marine Corps. I love finding that connection with people. In fact, I love going into uh, Mexican restaurants. I love Mexican food. And I love going into restaurants. And when I do that, I, I, I try to speak Spanish. I, I'll go in and say, hola, senorita, hola, senor, como esta? Soy muy bien, y tú? Ah, que bueno. My favorite Spanish phrase, and if you speak Spanish, this will make no sense to you, is esta la noche. All it means is it's the night. But I love that phrase. 
And so I'll do that trying to make that common connection. And then the server will look at me and they'll begin speaking much Spanish. And I have to say, wait a minute, time out. You're way past what I know. And so there, there's a need to establish a connection. Paul saw this with the people that he was dealing with. And he said, brothers and fathers, he spoke in their native language so they know who he was. The second thing that we have to understand today is that Paul was not proud of his past. See, sometimes when we hear a story of people talking about their past life before they come to know Christ, they almost glory it instead of bringing glory to the father. See, Paul says this, he says, I am indeed a Jew born in Tarsus, but brought up in this city at the feet of Gamaliel, taught according to the strictness of our father's law, and was zealous towards God as you all are today. I persecuted this way to death, binding and delivering into prison both men and women, as also the high priest bears me witness, and all the counsel of the elders from whom I also received letters to the brethren, and went to Damascus to bring in chains even those who were there in Jerusalem to be punished. Paul continues on in verse 19, and he says this, Lord, I replied, these people know that I went from one synagogue to another to imprison and beat those who believe in you. He says, and then the blood of your martyr Stephen was shed. I stood there giving my approval and guarding the clothes of those who were killing him. Paul tells about his past, but he doesn't glory in it. Matter of fact, as you read his words and, and we see them laid out on the paper, you can almost sense the pain. You can almost sense the heartache. You can almost sense the embarrassment. For me, being a, a, a high school student, having not known Christ, never, never, never surrendering my life to him. I was taught that to be a man, you had to be able to do two things. You had to be able to bench press 300 pounds and you had to be able to cuss like a sailor. Both of those in my high school years, I was really good at. I could put together words that, that, that would make parents cringe. I put together words that to students sounded cool. But in hindsight, after receiving Christ, Man, it was an embarrassment. It's something that I'm not proud of, but it is part of my past. See, I believe for some people, the reason they glory in their past is because they feel like that was the greatest time of excitement. That was when they had the most adventure. That's when they could do things that maybe other people didn't think they should be doing, and they could do things that kind of got out on the edge. The prophet Isaiah says in 43, verses 18 and 19, do not remember the former things, nor consider the things of old. Behold, I will do new thing. Now it shall spring forth. Shall you not know it? I will even make a road in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. Paul goes on and tells the church of Galatia, he says, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. So we have to establish a connection and we know that we have a past, right? Every, every saint has a future, every sinner has a past, but we don't glory in that past. But the third thing that we learn from Paul today is that believing is not easy living. Go with me if you will for just a minute. It's a Sunday morning, channel gazing through the TVs. We got to do a lot of this in the COVID times. But your attention's drawn to a popular Christian talk show. And as you tune into that talk show, you realize there's a guy on there. He's sharply dressed. His, his hair is well manicured. And he's all smiles. And he says this. He says, today is a special day for the Christian Health and Wealth Channel. Today, we're going to have somebody who has done so much for the kingdom and loves the Lord. As they take the pause, he says, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to present to you today St. Paul the Apostle. The audience is stunned. There's a silence except for a few isolated hallelujahs and praise the Lord's. Slowly, the audience musters the dazed applause and the camera focuses in on this rather small, dainty man who comes out dressed in this kind of ragged tunic. His face is sunburned. His skin is wrinkled. He looks like somebody who spent a lot of time outside in the woods in the sunshine. The camera slowly follows him and the host says, it's a real thrill to have you on the show, Paul. Or should I call you saint or apostle? Which do you prefer? The tiny man looks up and he says, Paul will be just fine. The host says, very well, we're, we're eager to hear what you have to say, a great servant of the Lord. Tell us about the wonderful things that have happened to you when you invited the Lord Jesus into your life. Paul says, well, let's see. First, I was struck blind. 
He goes on to say, but I got over that. Then somebody tried to kill me and I had to escape in a basket. And then they stoned me and they threw me in jail and they beat me with rods. The the host says, "Uh, Paul, Paul, wait a minute. I think you misunderstood what I asked. Tell us what has the Lord done for you? Paul says, that's what I was doing. Then the Romans arrested me. I was shipwrecked a day and a night and I spent it in the deep. The host comes back and says, "Uh, excuse me, ladies and gentlemen, we need to take a commercial break. See, here's the truth. Being a believer isn't always easy living. Now, it can be. When I came to know Christ, I ended up marrying my best friend. When I came to know, after I came to know Christ, I I had two beautiful daughters that I loved dearly, and they've since married two young men. And so now I have two sons. And let's just be honest, um, story's out on them a little bit, but we're working on that. See, we understand that great things can happen as a believer. But there's also the other side of that. After I come to know Christ, I got to perform the military rites for my stepmom who committed suicide. Just a few later, years later, I got to bury my mom, who was an alcoholic and died in a house fire. A few years into the ministry, I watched one of my best friends and one of my youth workers bury a 10-month-old son. Not too long after that, I buried a 14-year-old young man who was in my student ministry. Not too long after that, my wife's stepdad passed away of pulmonary fibrosis, and I performed his funeral. And then only a few years after that, my wife lost her 41-year-old sister to cancer. So yes, there are great things about being a believer in Christ, but it is not always easy living, and Paul tells us that. The fourth thing that we have to understand today is that there's a marked difference in a believer's life, and that marked difference is the power of Christ. See, not everybody has a dramatic story of conversion like Paul did. Not everybody's walking on the road to go see somebody persecuted who is a believer and and Jesus shows up on the scene and then they're struck blind and they go get their, their sight restored. Not everybody has the story of being a drug addict who is saved out of an addiction. Not everybody has a story of someone who is about to die and God steps in and intervenes and then they come to know Christ. I used to deal with students all the time who would come to me and say, Chris, I'm not really sure that I'm a believer in Christ. And I would say, why do you say that? And they said, because I don't have the same story that you have. I don't have the same story that this guy or that this girl has. And see, that's okay, because we have to understand it's not always about the drama of the story of our conversion, but it is about the fact that there's a marked difference, and that difference is the power of Christ. Paul goes on to say, or goes on to say in Acts chapter 22, Verse 6, now it happened as I journeyed and came near Damascus at about noon. Suddenly a great light from heaven shone around me. And I fell to the ground and I heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? So I answered, who are you, Lord? And he said to me, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. And those who were with me indeed saw the light and were afraid, but they did not hear the voice of him who spoke to me. So I said, what shall I do, Lord? And the Lord said to me, Arise and go into Damascus, and there you'll be told all things which are appointed to you to do. See, Paul's life displayed changes. They were marked differences in him. And it was the power of Christ, because when you can go from executing to somebody to loving on somebody, that is only through the power of Christ. For me, I can remember being one of those people that I told you used the words that I shouldn't use in high school. And then at 19, when Christ saved me, I never used those words again. I can remember being in Baltimore, Maryland in 1999. I was working on a row home about three and a half stories up. We were a college group. We had some college students around. And this one particular young lady, she was in the Army Reserves. And she knew I would served in the military. And all she wanted to do was talk military. She really didn't want a roof. She just wanted to talk military. So she crawled up on the roof. We're up there strapped in with ropes. And uh, just to be quite honest, it was pretty high. She gets to the top and she begins to tell me how afraid she is of heights. And so, of course, I'm looking around going, well, what are you doing up here? She just wanted to talk military. So as we were nailing these nails into the shingles, I remember her talking. And I I wasn't smart enough then. I hadn't done enough mission trips to know that when you hold a nail, if you hold it with your palm side up and the nail in your finger, when you hit your hand, it doesn't hurt near as bad. I was still holding it the old-fashioned way with two fingers and palms down. 
I can remember I, my, my goal that afternoon was to see, could I get the nail in with one strike? As I reared back and had the nail in my hand, I came down on it. At the same time, she began to slide down the roof and make some noise. I looked up to see what was going on. I was already in motion, couldn't stop the momentum. And I hit my finger, my pointer finger, right on the edge. Almost took half of it off. I can remember she got down off the roof. I I bit my tongue for a little bit. I got down off the roof. And one of the gentlemen on the ground said, Chris, I I can't believe you did that. And I said, what, hit my finger? I mean, it was really easy. Hammer came right down on it. He said, no, you did that. And you didn't say anything you shouldn't have said. I remember looking at him and saying, there was a time when I would have. But by the power of Christ, I didn't. See, there has to be a a marked difference in our life, and that difference is Christ. But the fifth thing that we learn today is that the conversion is an undeniable fact, not just a warm feeling. Paul's story was based on verifiable facts as we look through this that people could attest to. It says in verse 11, And since I could not see for the glory of the light being led by the hand of those who were with me, I came to Damascus. He goes on to say, then a certain Ananias, a devout man, according to the law, having a good testimony with all the Jews dwelt there, came to me. And he stood and said to me, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that same hour, I looked up at him. And then he said, the God of our fathers has chosen you that you should know his will and see the just one and hear the voice of his mouth. For you will be a witness to all men what you have seen and heard. Can I ask you something today from wherever you're watching? Was your conversion to Christ an undeniable fact or just a warm feeling? I deal with people time to time to time to time that will come to me and say, man, I I feel like I accepted Christ. I feel like I've been forgiven. The gospel is not a feel-good gospel. It is an undeniable gospel. It is an undeniable fact when we accept Christ. Can I ask you a couple more questions today? If today we had to stand before Christ himself and we haven't given an account for our life, not tell him what we know, but ask him what he knows. Let's just say for the moment that there was a, a place within your house that, or wherever you're watching today that we placed a chair and that was the seat of Christ. And you had a step before him and, and he was going to give you a thumbs up or he was going to give you a thumbs down on your relationship with him. Where would it be today? There are those of you that have a relationship with Christ and it's thriving and you're out telling other people about Jesus and what he's done in your life. I also believe that there are people watching today that have a relationship with Christ, but yet you tell nobody. Matter of fact, you're more interested in talking about the left or the right side of politics. You're more interested in talking about football. Maybe you're more interested in talking about the politics of football. See, here's what I know. Revival's not going to come in this world when we start talking about the left or the right or the president or the governor or the city council. Revival is going to come in this world when we start sharing our story, the second greatest story ever told. And then there are people who are watching this that yet to have a relationship with Christ. Maybe you thought you did, maybe it felt like you did, but it's not an undeniable fact. So back to that chair. If you had to stand before Christ today, would he say that you have a thriving relationship with him? And that you're sharing about him to other people? Would he say that you have a relationship with him, but ask you why you don't share? Or would he look you eye to eye and say, you don't know me? See, here's what I believe in this era that we're in. Many of us would approach Christ and and we would do it just like this. We, we, We would put our mask on, right? Thinking that we're protecting him from something, but I don't think Jesus is very concerned about COVID 19 right now. But the truth is, we would put this mask on because we would think it would hide our condition from him. Let me tell you something this mask has not cured COVID 19, it's only slowed down the spread. The same way this mask won't hide your brokenness, it won't hide what you think you are, but you know that you're not. Because Jesus can see right through it. The only cure today is him. 
And so this is going to seem a little odd for some of you because you're watching. Maybe you're not sitting in a church setting. But I'm going to ask you today to, to find a spot in your home, find a spot in your car, find a spot in the coffee shop, and that to become your altar. And I'm going to ask you to approach that altar and ask either God to, to forgive you for not sharing the gospel, for not sharing the second greatest story ever told. I'm going to ask you to approach that altar and ask God to save you. And for some of you, I'm going to ask you to approach that altar and celebrate what God is doing and has done in your life. And I know what you're thinking today. You're thinking, well, why do I need an altar to do that? Why, why do I need to pretend that my living room, my couch, uh, uh, wherever I'm at, why do I need to pretend that's an altar? Because here's, the, here's what I've learned over the years, that an altar is a place of sacrifice. When Abraham took his son and he placed him up on the altar, that was a place of sacrifice. And sometimes it takes a, a sacrifice to get up out of our seat to go make a commitment to Christ. My daughter was diagnosed almost a year ago to the day with a brain tumor. A few weeks after she was diagnosed, we took her to Duke to have an awake craniotomy. And I had to place my daughter on the altar of that hospital table. It was not a fun place. And it was not an easy place. And so, yes, the altar is a place of sacrifice and the altar can be a place of pain as God tries to flesh those things out of us. But understand this, too, the altar can be a place of celebration and worship. You're asking me, Chris, how can that be? Because when Abraham placed his son on there and God provided a substitution, you think Abraham didn't celebrate at that altar? As my daughter was on that table and then after the surgery was over and everything went as well as could, could go, you think that her bed where she had that surgery wasn't a place of celebration for me? So I'm going to ask you this morning, stand before Christ today. Let him measure you against his word. And then find an altar, either an altar of sacrifice or an altar of celebration, because it can be both. Listen, we're going to continue this morning in just a little more worship. But as we do that, would you pray with me? Father God, we love you. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity that you've given us to spend time with you today. Lord, there are five parts of the second greatest story ever told. God, my prayer this morning and today is that those that know Christ know the greatest story ever told. That those that maybe you're hearing it for the first time understand the greatest story ever told. But God, I pray that us as believers would begin to tell the second greatest story ever told, an undeniable fact that nobody can argue with, that we were once lost, but now we're found. We were once blind, but now we can see. It was once dark, but now it's light. God, may others experience that as well. And Father God, we'll be quick to give you all the honor, all the praise, and all the glory, because you and you alone truly are an awesome God. I told you at the beginning that today's message was really going to challenge you both in your walk with Christ, your relationship with Christ, and even as you share your faith with people uh, in your sphere of influence. If, if today, for some reason, uh, you just haven't responded yet and you really uh, are burned on your heart to respond to that message this morning, we give you that opportunity via text. We'll put the number on the screen. Text the keyword Jesus to 803 310-4455. Use that keyword. We'll ask you a few questions. Just let us know exactly what that decision is that the Lord has led you to make today. And we would rejoice with you, look forward to praying with you, and even connecting with you uh, as you maybe connect with our local fellowship in person or one in your community. So thank you for joining us this morning. And as we go out, we're going to continue to have some music um, and looking forward to seeing you again next week. I've been held in your hands From the moment that I wake up Until I lay my head down I will sing of the goodness of God All my life you have been Your voice.